This is Classical Ideas with Greg Soden. Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. Studying the ancient Greeks is something that many young people do in some capacity in school, whether that is through mythology, learning about democracy, or the ever-present term, Socratic seminar. In my religious studies courses with high school students, my students learn about the life of Socrates, mainly through the lens of the writings of Plato. In another episode of this show, I did a reading of Euthyphro by Plato, performed alongside my friend Mackenzie Everett Kennedy, and you can find that in episode 6 of this show. The students really love learning about the life of Socrates and his trial and his death, and they are amazed to read Euthyphro in portions of Plato's Apology. They always ask questions about why Socrates died, and in the past I've found myself somewhat unsure of what to say because I've since realized I did not know the whole historical context leading up to his death. So my guest today is a scholar by the name of Robin Waterfield, and he helps me dig into these exact questions today. He has a remarkable book, that was published in 2009, called Why Socrates Died, Dispelling the Myths. And it tells a rather remarkable story of politics, war, the messiness of Athenian democracy, and it paints a picture of ancient Greece in the 4th century BCE. And learning about this is essential for learning about the context and history for why Socrates was accused of impiety and corrupting the young, why he was tried, and why he was sentenced to death in the year 399 BCE. Robin Waterfield is the author of numerous books, translations, and articles about ancient Greek history and philosophy, and he spoke to me from his home in Greece, and you can find him online at www.robinwaterfield.com. Without further delay, here's my chat with Robin Waterfield. I'm really excited to do an episode on Socrates with you, so thank you so much, Robin, for coming on uh, the show and spending some time with me today. It's a pleasure. So I'm wondering if we can just start by having you introduce yourself a little bit to the audience. I know that you have quite a prolific amount of writing and translating work under your belt, so if you could just introduce yourself to the audience, that'd be great. Uh, Yeah, that's right. My name is Robin Waterfield. Um, I'm British, but uh, I live in in Greece. I live in southern Greece on a small olive farm, small enough that I don't have to work on it too much, so I have time to write my books. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I used to be a university lecturer in uh, in Britain, uh, briefly, but um, for most of my working life, I've been a self-employed writer, and that's what I do. As you said, I write. Nowadays, I'm writing almost entirely books on ancient Greek history, Uh, Although in the past I've written children's fiction, a biography, a book on hypnosis, and all sorts of other things. But uh, these days I'm concentrating entirely on ancient Greek stuff. And I kind of went through your website, and I counted up how many works that you have on your site. And it seems like you've translated... (laughs) It's embarrassing. (laughs) I mean, it's something like 30 works from ancient Greek, right? Yes, and then a whole bunch more, yeah. And when I started, I was doing things like um, rewriting other people's books, like I rewrote Little Women, Louisa Alcott's Little Women, and I rewrote, I don't know, The Last of the Mohicans and things like that. Uh, so, but, I, uh, but we can discount those. So, yeah, it's about 40, 40, 40 or so books. Excellent. So How did you come to be so deeply interested in the ancient world? I think that was a mixture of uh, nurture and nature. The nurture was that um, I came through a very traditional form of British education, 
uh, which stressed languages and particularly the ancient languages so that I started learning Latin when I was eight and Greek when I was 10, ancient Greek when I was 10. So uh, that's just the way things were and the type of schooling that I went through. And I think at, at some point that corresponded with a, uh, an abiding love of the ancient world. I'm, I'm one of those people who, if something is old, it is automatically more attractive to me than something that is new. Hmm. And I think I've always been like that. And even when I was a small child, if I had, you know, if somebody gave me a book token for Christmas or something, I might go out and spend it on a book on, on the ancient world. I've always been fascinated by it. So this combination of being introduced to the classical world at a very young age and then having some kind of innate uh, attraction at the same time. They met, and they've done me very well. I um, I taught in Surrey for a year early in my oh, teaching. Whereabouts? Uh, in Guildford and Woking. Yeah, I lived in Cobham for quite a while. Excellent. Yeah, well, one of my parents lived in, lived in Cobham, so about 20 miles up the road from Guildford. Lovely. Um, so one of the things that I did is I taught history classes, and we taught yeah. um, about the ancient world and the Greeks and the Romans in year seven. So I'd imagine that you were probably the best year seven student imaginable, weren't you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was no, actually by year seven. What, what age is year seven? No, I'd already got very lazy. Um, uh, I actually, you know, I kind of coasted through school the way a lot of bright kids do. Sure. And only really discovered a true passion for classics, I would say, when I got to university. I went to university, I did my undergraduate degree at Manchester University, a very warm and friendly place. And it was there that I was encouraged to develop. And uh, they left me pretty much on my own. And uh, yeah, I discovered that I really loved the classics. Excellent. So I want to speak to you today specifically about one of your books, your book about Socrates, called Why Socrates Died, Dispelling the Myths. And it came out about nine years ago, it seems. And the book tells a really remarkable story of politics, war, the messiness of democracy, which I found to be a really compelling subplot. And it sort of painted a picture of like ancient Greece in the 4th century BCE. So if you could just briefly describe your major argument and purpose for writing that book, that'd be great. Well, that, I mean, what you've said, Greg, is essentially it. Um, I mean, I've subtitled the book Dispelling the Myths. So I'm going to bundle this question up with your next question as well, because that was, that was my chief purpose, was to dispel the myth. Socrates is a household figure. He's an iconic figure. Everybody knows something about him or think they know something about him. But his, his trial and death um, had, in my opinion, been too long in the hands of philosophers. It was chiefly philosophers, not historians, who were reading Plato's Apology of Socrates. Uh, that's the Apology of Socrates is Plato's version of the defense speech that Socrates gave at his trial. They, these philosophers studied that very closely uh, and came up with some, some brilliant ideas about it. Uh, but these ideas always lacked historical context. For instance, um, in Plato's Apology of Socrates, Plato had Socrates never once address any political issue. So all the philosophers who studied the book have, uh, have ignored politics entirely and said, and said the whole thing had nothing to do with politics. It had to do with uh, impiety, irreligiousness, and things like that. But this, to me, was, was too um, ahistorical an approach to the book. Uh, and also, I should also add that they concentrate only on the one book. They concentrate on Plato's Apology of Socrates and more or less entirely ignore all the many things that Xenophon, uh, another student of Socrates, has said about his trial and death as well. So it was frustration with those two things. Firstly, that the, that the book had been too long in the hands of philosophers who had studied it ahistorically. And secondly, that they were ignoring Xenophon. They were failing to give, I felt, a rounded picture of Socrates. And also, I suppose, there was a third thing, which was a personal thing, which is that I spent uh, the first 20 years 
25 years of my life as a classicist doing philosophy. But um, starting at about the year 2000, I began the transition to writing history rather than philosophy. So in a sense, studying Plato's Apology and Xenophon's Apology of Socrates from a historical rather than a philosophical point of view was part of my personal passage from being a philosopher, from working as a philosopher to working as a historian. So to me, it was a very important book. So when you transitioned from being a philosopher to a historian, is that when you started noticing some of the distinctions and the differences um, that recount the life of Socrates? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Partic- particularly, as I say, the fact that um, uh, the the sort of basic analysis of, of the relevant texts was to say uh, Socrates was put on trial for because he was subversive religiously. But that kind of like ignores half of the charge against him and, as I say, ignores the whole historical context. So that was, that was the reason. I love that. So you went from going to thinking about the arguments when, as a philosopher to thinking about the events in the context so about as the, a historian. about the context, really. I yeah. mean, any, any trial, uh, particularly of an important person, needs historical context. It doesn't happen just out of the blue. So that's, that's why a great deal of the book, as you said a few minutes ago, is actually contextualizing the trial by giving all the details of how the Athenian legal system worked, what was going on politically and in terms of warfare at the time and so on and so forth, to, put, to make Socrates come alive as a living historical human being and then to see what he might have done wrong. Excellent. So let's go through our cast of characters very briefly, and I just want the, um, uh, hold on. The thumbnail sketch. Yeah, yeah. So let's go through our cast of characters very briefly and just introduce who these people are for the listener. And when I say briefly, I mean very briefly. So um, just in a couple of sentences, what is Socrates most famous for? Um, <laughs> in a couple of sentences. Um, asking questions, bringing philosophy down, as it were, from the heavens, so that it was focused more on uh, human beings, the way they think, and their moral life. Excellent. So some then uh, now that we know about Socrates, there are several characters that I was not very familiar with, and you introduce them in great depth in the book. And arguably the most important character in the book besides Socrates himself is Alcibiades, correct? Certainly, he was he was a uh, young. He was uh, considerably younger than Socrates. He was a young nobleman um, from both his mother's side and his father's side, coming from high Athenian aristocracy, and he was temperamentally uh, extremely arrogant um, and extremely spoiled and extremely good-looking. He, he managed to have his way. Uh, whenever he wanted it. Uh, but he and Socrates were lovers for, we don't know how many years, but uh, for a number of years. So it was this this odd pairing between the famous philosopher and this wild child of Athens. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating. So what is Alcibiades, um, what was his role in... Um, the wars. Like, can you give a little more description on Alcibiades and his role in, like, the Peloponnesian War? Okay, the Peloponnesian War started in 431, by which time Socrates and Alcibiades were already acquainted. But Alcibiades was too young to play much of a part in the first ten years of the war. He really started to come to the fore around about the 420s, uh, manipulating things so that he could get his own way, and he became the kind of the leader of the war party, eventually. There was a kind of a, a, a few years of rather um, tentative peace uh, from 421 onwards, uh, but Alcibiades throughout that time was pushing for a resumption of warfare, and not least because it would give him a chance to shine. He wanted to make himself the effective leader of Athens, 
And in fact, it's not it's quite clear that he probably wanted to make himself the actual political leader of Athens, some kind of despot or tyrant. At least that's what he was suspected of. Um, he, but he betrayed Athens. He was put on trial, or he was about to be put on trial for uh, some sacrilege that he'd uh, carried out, but he jumped ship uh, and didn't come to court, and he went over to the other side. Athens was fighting Sparta in the war, and Alcibiades went and... Uh, uh, you know, gave useful information and uh, and ideas to the Spartans about how to defeat the Athenians. So for a while he was a traitor, but then he was welcomed back to Athens. I mean, the Athenians were in a mess at the time. They didn't know what to do. So Alcibiades was exiled. Then he was welcomed back. He did Athens a lot of good in the war, but then he was banished again, and that was the end of his career. Okay, so that betrayal of Athens is going to become really important in our conversation in just a little while. Yeah. Um, we're going to come back yeah. to that a lot. So can you next describe who Critias is? Critias. Well, he was um, uh, an older man. I mean, probably the same age as Socrates or thereabouts. He was, again, a traditional Athenian aristocrat. But what's most important about him was that he was uh, an admirer of Sparta, now, he wasn't alone in this. There was a um, strong thread, especially among upper-class Athenians, to admire Sparta as a, as a disciplined regime, uh, socially. But they also took it further and went beyond admiration of Spartan society to admiration of Spartan politics as well. And Critias was definitely one of those. He wanted uh, to... As it turned out, uh, he wanted to remodel Athens along the lines of Spartan society. And, of course, this was not popular with uh, the current Athenians. But he, too, like Alcibiades, was a close associate of Socrates. And he's not alone. There are a number of, a number of people in the Socratic circle who belonged to this uh, high stratum of Athenian society. And it was exactly this stratum that was A, keen on Sparta and fond of Spartan politics, and B, was concerned basically to change Athenian society. They were dissatisfied with Athenian society. Athenian society was in some kind of crisis at the time, some kind of social crisis. Uh, when it was Alcibiades, Critias, and that set who were looking more towards Sparta and wanted to make some changes in Athens. Okay, so then there's also a group of teachers known as the Sophists, and who are they? Well, uh, it's not a very happy term because it bundles together uh, a lot of different thinkers. Uh, and in fact, it's perfectly legitimate to call Socrates a sophist. What the sophists did was they taught means of success to rich young men. It had to be rich young men because they charged quite high fees. Or at least Socrates didn't, but everybody else did. Um, uh, when I say they taught success, that meant, to most of the sophists, that meant uh, political success. They taught, for instance, the art of speaking, the art of arguing. But they also taught um, everything from uh, martial arts to grammar to, you know, things that we would recognize more as philosophy, they speculated about the gods and whatever, whatever. But they were all very much part of that process that I mentioned a, a few minutes ago of bringing philosophy down to earth. They wanted to focus on society, on man's place in society, what man could do for himself, and kind of sideline the gods and uh, the grand picture in favor of focusing on, on human beings. Okay, so now that we have sort of a cast of characters um, who have done a diverse range of actions, um, including sidelining the gods, betraying um, Athens, there's another figure in the book who comes into great prominence near the end, and his name is Anitus. Who is Anitus? We, we don't know very much about Anitus, um, uh, and we know even less about Socrates' other two accusers, but Anitus was the chief um, or what, one, one, of the, one of the chief accusers of Socrates. He was, um, I think the only thing that's really important about him is that he was 
an ardent Democrat. And that, of course, gives us an important clue to the trial. Um, Anitis was a, a Democrat, and so were the other two prosecutors, Militus and Lycan. Uh, we know that much about them. And so it seems pretty clear, just from that alone, that there was political motivation to the trial. This was one of the most prominent... This, this would be like... Oh, I can't think of an American example, sorry. This would be like... This would be like... Oh, I don't know. I was going to say Arthur Scargill taking Margaret Thatcher to court, but that's an old and British reference. So that's completely <laughs> that's fine. For you. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, he was a prominent Democrat and he took Socrates to court. That's important. Excellent. Okay, so Socrates is a well-known um, figure in Athens. He sticks out. He's a teacher. He famously does not take money for his teaching. So um, what is a day of Socrates like? How does he spend his time? What do people find irritating about his lifestyle when he was alive? This is, this is of course, a very difficult question because, I mean, we're not there. All, all we've got are works written by Plato and Xenophon, and then also uh, Socrates features in one of the plays by the comic playwright Aristophanes as well, his play Cloud, that was produced in 423. But, um, you know, these are all, all three of these are, in their own ways, artificial and fictional pictures of Socrates. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the honest answer to your question is we don't know. Um, in, you see, Xenophon shows a Socrates who gives, who delivers homilies. He gives sound, practical, moral advice to friends of his who are having some kind of crisis uh, or, you know, in their lives or something like that. Plato, Socrates, is completely different. He's this pungent, often rather unpleasant character who uh, questions people and won't let them go and points out their mistakes and then even after pointing out their mistakes p digs the knife in and gives it an extra twist as well. These uh, very hard and ferocious questions, many of which uh, are not really capable of being answered. So uh, it's when you ask why were his why was his questioning you know an object of suspicion or an object of dislike it's that latter portrait it's plato's portrait of socrates that you're talking about but he may not have been like that he may have been more like xenophon socrates plato plato had his own mission which was to uh invent really what we would call philosophy and he used socrates as a mouthpiece for that but whether that was socrates's mission we don't know that has to be irritating as a historian. Like, who do we believe? <laughs> well, it's the name of the game, though, isn't it? There's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, until, they, until they invent time travel, I'll be the first to go back. I would. I'm sure that that would be fantastic. Um, so you mentioned earlier that Alcibiades is an incredibly um, uh, controversial figure and was charged with betraying Greece and Athens, and we know that. Um, Socrates was Alcibiades' teacher. So yeah. what factor does that play into um, Socrates being charged? Like, um, And what was Socrates specifically charged with around the age of 70? Okay, well, um, you've got more than one question there. Sorry the, about the that. The actual charges are easy to answer because we very luckily have the actual wording of the charges against Socrates, and so I can read those out for you, which I'll do, which is, just getting there. Um, this indictment and affidavit is sworn by Miletus, son of Miletus of Pictus, against Socrates, the son of Sophoniscus of Alapiki. Socrates is guilty of not acknowledging the gods the city acknowledges and of introducing other new divinities. He is also guilty of subverting the young men of the city. The penalty demanded is death. That, those, that is the actual wording of the actual charges brought against Socrates in 399. Okay, so now how does his role of educating controversial young men play into that subversion charge? Right. I mean, well, this to me, see, let's go back to what I was saying before about the philosophical historical approach to, to the relevant texts. The, 
Philosophers focus on the first bit of that charge. Socrates is guilty of not acknowledging the gods the city acknowledges and of introducing other new divinities. Okay? Mm -hmm. What I do is focus more on the second part of the charge. He is also guilty of subverting the young men of the city. So in other words, it wasn't just that he was irreligious, but that he was, he was uh, introducing the young men of the city, the next and particularly wealthy young men, in other words, the next generation of politicians, of, of Athenian leaders, he was introducing them to irreligious and subversive ideas. I've okay. lost track of your question. Yeah, so Socrates is living in Athens, which is a well-known historical example of a kind of democracy, and yet he is somewhat of a critic of democracy. So in order to break this down a little more, we know that Alcibiades was um, against democracy. So what does Socrates say in critique of the system of democracy at the time? All right, let's go. I, I just remembered what your earlier question was, which was, uh, I mean, okay, Critias was in Socrates' circle, Charmides was, Alcibiades was, and a lot of other of these uh, um, aristocrats who had become objects of political suspicion, I think, were members of his circle. They, the accusers assumed that they had learned all of their political views from Socrates. That was undoubtedly the main plank of their case. Now, recovering Socrates' political views is, of course, very difficult for exactly the reason that I've already said, which is we simply don't know how much of the evidence we have is, is fiction. I mean, I think it's all fiction. Um, but uh, perhaps by putting together places where Xenophon says something and Plato confirms it, perhaps we can add those two together and say, okay, that's more likely to be one of Socrates' views. But there's not very much politics in, in these works by Plato and Xenophon. But what there is is very telling. For instance, I think the, the absolute heart of Socratic politics is that he thought it was completely senseless for um, politicians to be chosen by sortition, by the lot. One of the main planks of Athenian democracy, which, by the way, you described as a type of democracy, and I would describe as the only true democracy there's ever been, but we can talk about that another, on another <laughs> occasion. <laughs> um, uh, the Athenian democracy relied very uh, for, for certain jobs, for jobs which required expertise, either military expertise or financial expertise, they elected their politicians, just as we do. But for the great majority of the uh, political posts in democratic Athens, uh, election wasn't used, but sortition. In other words, it was a lottery. Uh, you took out a pebble, and if the pebble said so-and-so, then so-and-so became you know, an archon or um, a member of the council or something else. Uh, this was, if you like, a way of letting the gods have their say. Uh, you know, leaving it up to the gods, leaving it up to the lot to to choose your leaders for that year. And that's another thing about the Athenian democracy. Leaders were only chosen for one year at a time. They uh, they couldn't, uh, they, they, it was difficult for them to stay in power longer and, and create a kind of a personal power base. But what, so for Socrates, this use of the lottery was stupid. He said, look, you wouldn't choose any other, in any other field, you wouldn't choose experts in this way. You wouldn't use the lottery to decide who's going to represent us in the Olympics. You wouldn't use the lottery, you know, to decide uh, who was going to be a general. So he called for politics to be returned to the hands of experts and taken away from the lottery. And this, this is at the heart of, of his politics. And this, of course, goes directly against Athenian democracy. So in other words, what Socrates was calling for was for a limited number of truly professional politicians to be running Athens. And uh, that was completely the opposite of what the democracy wanted. Yeah, Socrates seems to want uh, the government by the best people. 
And if you know anything about, I mean, every listener out there knows that not the best people get to run countries today. People who are <laughs> terrible people get elected democratically all the time. Um, well, naming their names, yeah. Yeah. So it, does that seem, does that sound accurate that he wants government by the best people specifically? Yes, exactly so. Um, it was an aristocracy in the literal sense of the term, aristos meaning best. It was, so it was the rule of the best. What this would actually have looked like, to anticipate your question on that, is, I think, best shown by Plato's Republic. Are you familiar with Plato's Republic? A bit, yes. But it's been... I mean, in, it's that, been... In, that, in, in that book, Plato imagines a society which is being run by philosopher rulers. He says that the only hope for contemporary society is if philosophers become rulers and rulers become philosophers. Uh, and so this, too, is a very small number, a limited number of people who've, who go through rigorous training in order that they can run society uh, for the best, in, in order that they can make all the members of society happy, um, uh, fulfilled, I should say, perhaps is better than happy, to the best of their abilities. Excellent. So that was the, uh, the kind of society Socrates had in mind was exactly what Plato had in mind also. So what is the distinction of the young people, the young generation like Alcibiades versus the old as far as democracy goes? And why does that distinction matter? Well, it wasn't a hard and fast age distinction. It, it seems to me that um, the opponents of the young... Um, used the term the young simply for anybody who disagreed with him or for anybody who aligned himself with Alcibiades and his set. And some of them might actually have been, you know, older people in terms of uh, age. Um, but the young were, to me, the best parallel, Greg, is to think of um, the late 60s and early 70s in America and, and Northern Europe, where you've got a youth revolution of some kind, but it's fairly inchoate. There's, no, there's not necessarily any hard core to it, except a dissatisfaction with the way uh, our parents' generation have run things and look at the mess they've got us into. So let's, let's take a totally different approach and try to see if we can remake society afresh. Um, uh, that didn't necessarily make the young anti-democratic, some of them were certainly Democrats, but they wanted to rethink things from the start. And of course, Socrates, with his questioning of everything, taking everything back to basics, was uh, an ideal figurehead for them. Okay, so in this uh, moment, what is the climate surrounding um, intellectuals in Athens? Uh they were tolerated. I mean, Athens was um, a fairly open society. It wasn't, it certainly didn't persecute intellectuals. But if they drew attention to themselves in a political sense, in other words, if they said or did something that the uh, Athenian people could feel to be opposed to democracy, then they could get into trouble. And so we know of... Um, two or three intellectuals who got into some kind of trouble in the couple of decades preceding Socrates' trial. The evidence is rather difficult. You know, some people say they were taken to court and some people don't say that. So we don't know what degree of trouble these people got into. But there was, if, if an intellectual drew attention to himself by criticizing democracy or by seeming to criticize democracy, then he could get into trouble. So, for instance, a man called Damon, um, an intellectual, actually a musicologist is what he was chiefly known for, but he, was a, he also was a political theorist. He was a friend of the statesman Pericles. So he was sent into exile. The sophist Protagoras also got into trouble. The philosopher or proto-scientist Anaxagoras also got into trouble. But um, none of them got into as bad trouble as Socrates. So it seems like this charge of impiety wouldn't really fly in a lot of countries today where some nations reject connections between religion and state matters. So No, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. It wouldn't, it wouldn't fly. But 
Athenian democracy was, Athenian society was absolutely bound up with religion. In fact, there's quite a, a good and interesting theory about uh, Athenian democracy, which is that uh, in all the changes that it went through, all the changes that it went through were designed to keep the gods smiling on Athens. So you can see Athenian democracy as much a, a religious as a political system. Was it was it started, it started at the end of the sixth century by by Socrates' time. Let's say by the middle of the fifth century, the Athenian people have taken upon themselves a great number of uh, religious prerogatives. Uh, the design of temples, the they had the say so as to which gods were worshipped in Athens and which were not to be worshipped in Athens, and so on and so forth. Was piety in Socrates' day just a big popularity contest? No, it was more than that, much more than that, because it was absolutely essential, um, or this is the way they felt it, as I said, religion permeated every aspect of society, so it was absolutely essential that the gods remained in favor of Athens. And the way they did that is if everybody carried out their religious duties. If everybody was praying, if everybody was sacrificing on the appropriate occasions, if everybody had the correct attitude towards the gods, so it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, it, it was, and this is why this is why piety is in itself a political issue in Athens, because if Socrates was not performing the correct sacrifices, he was jeopardizing the relationship between the gods and Athens, and the Athenian people could not could not tolerate that because it was their job to keep the gods smiling on Athens and so he got into trouble. So for all these reasons that we've just that you've just described, he faces a trial. And one of the major things in the book that really jumped out at me is the descriptions that you include about the jury and trial system in ancient Athens. What would modern people recognize and not recognize about this jury and trial so, system? They'd recognize hardly anything. Well, this is this is a very big topic, and I can't yeah. uh, I can't do more than scratch the surface of it. But, for instance, <clears throat> right, you walk into an Athenian courtroom. The jury doesn't number twelve; it numbers in the hundreds. Um, there's no judge. There's no that is there's no legal expert to instruct these hundreds of people. They're simply there on their own as typical members of the Athenian public. There's no public prosecutor's office. It's up to um, the injured individual himself or, his, or a member of his family or just in certain classes of cases, any uh, interested member of the public. This is what happened in Socrates' case. Anitis, Lycon, and Miletus had no personal beef against Socrates, they, or they claimed not to, they claimed to be taking him to court because that was the right thing for Athens. They, as concerned citizens of Athens, would prosecute uh, Socrates, and that's how the system worked. So that, makes, that made Athenian courts a perfect arena for personal contests, uh, because you've got, you know, an individual is allowed to take another individual to court. So the courts commonly became uh, political ball games, like, for instance, in the 4th century when Demosthenes and Aeschines were fighting really about who was going to be the top politician in Athens, but they used the law courts always, always, to try to decide that issue. And so you've got these untrained, hundreds of untrained, inexpert people who have to decide the case. Uh, their Athenian laws were not defined very uh, no sorry let's say Athenian laws were defined but Athenian but crimes were not defined under Athenian law with any precision whatsoever so you know you for instance um, in Socrates's case you would say uh, you would charge Socrates with impiety but impiety was not specifically defined so the whole point then of what I'm coming to is that in an Athenian courtroom uh, what the prosecutor did and, uh, and what the defender defended against was the prosecutor tried to convince these hundreds of jurors that uh, Socrates was not an honorable member of Athenian society. And in order to do that, uh, prosecutors could say all sorts of things. The law 
wasn't much evidence on its own because, as we say, the laws didn't, didn't define crimes with any precision. So Athenian court cases, Athenian speech, court speech, well, that's another thing. No court case lasted longer than a day. Hmm. Speeches were given back and forth, but they were never expected to last longer than a day. So the whole thing seems very amateur. But prosecutors and defenders could say whatever they liked about about the other individual, because there wasn't there was no police force to gather evidence. Any evidence, any actual evidence that was gathered, was gathered by the prosecutor and then the defence themselves. So the prosecutor, the prosecutors could could stand up there and say whatever they liked about their opponents, and that they could accuse them of being the sons of slaves. They could accuse them of being, you know, um, totally immoral people. They could say things that were entirely irrelevant to the to the case at hand, whether the charge was impiety or whatever it was, because the point was to try to convince the jury that, that this person was not an Athenian Democrat, was not good for Athenian democracy, and, and uh, if they succeeded, then the person was found guilty. So it seems like the evidence against Socrates and the arguments in court were very circumstantial, right? Absolutely. And so it seems like uh, today, like a comparison would be like when a, a a lawyer or a solicitor would stand up and say, "Objection, Your Honor, irrelevant." It, does that make sense? Uh, I'm not quite understanding. So, like, if a, if somebody would like make some circumstantial or irrelevant evidence in court against a defendant. Um, oh yes, yes, yes. In today's courts, uh, none of the evidence would stand up at all. Gotcha. Okay. So, what does um, this mean at the time within the context of Athenian society? Like, would would Socrates be considered subversive today? Like, is there like a modern day equivalent of like a Socrates that we might think of as um, sort of a comparable example? Well, I th- I think he wouldn't be put on trial today. I think we're a lot more tolerant. And as you've already mentioned, uh, we do now have the separation of church and state. So it would have been it would be impossible to, um, you know, he might be excommunicated, let's say, but he wouldn't be put on trial. I don't know if there are modern equivalents. I think, um, I mean, one might think of certain provocative journalists like Christopher Hitchens. Mm-hmm. Maybe he's a modern Socrates, or one might think of some of the. Uh, I call them the satirists, you know, people like Stephen Colbert and Trevor Noah and Samantha Bee and uh, John Oliver. People, you see, Socrates, remember, famously, or Plato had Socrates describe himself as a gadfly on society, right? Yeah. Constantly, constantly prodding the Athenians to wake them up, to make them look and see what they were doing instead of just complacently going along. So I think, I think John Oliver and his ilk do that to a certain extent. They are gadflies. So I think that's pretty close to Socrates. And it's really amazing, like, the effect that folks like John Oliver actually have. Um, like, he embarrasses huge organizations, and they threaten him <clears throat> relentlessly, and he carries yeah. on. So yeah. when, you were, when you were, uh, yeah. when you were uh, researching this book, did you travel to any historical sites? Um... For this book, no, I don't think I did. Um, I'm, I'm very, I, I live in Greece, as I said. I'm very familiar with, um, with Athens and all, the, and all the sites there. But uh, I wasn't going further afield, as I do with, with most of my other books. So I didn't have to, like, for one of my books, for instance, uh, I went to Albania for a couple of weeks and things like that. Oh, but no, I don't think I traveled for this one. Um, so... You put yourself in the book in several places, like where you state your specific thoughts in relation to other scholars, like whether you agree or disagree. Um, what kind of uh, specific thoughts do you have about the charges leveled against Socrates? Like, how would you judge the, these charges? Oh, I, I think uh, he was guilty. Within, within the context of Athenian society as it was, at the time, and within the context of the Athenian legal system, as it was in the time, he was guilty. Uh, he was put on trial. It was a fair trial. He was found guilty. So what? I don't think there's anything more that can be can be said about that. I mean, th- there have been several. I can think of two, at any rate, uh, 
um, cases where people have mocked up a modern trial of Socrates to find out whether he'd be found guilty now or not, but they never work because you have to be absolutely embedded within Athenian society in order to understand the trial. And by Athenian lights, he was guilty. You you mentioned um, one one random question that springs to mind is, you mentioned Jesus a few times in the book. Um, is there a specific reason why you tied in the story of Jesus? I only mentioned him a couple of times. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned him ch- chiefly because it's it's an almost inevitable uh, thought that's triggered in, in a lot of people's minds. They like to compare Jesus and Socrates. These were both good people who were put on trial and condemned to death, um, and people will want to add unfairly to that sentence. I don't in Socrates' case. Uh, I may not even in Jesus' case either, who knows. Um, but uh, chiefly, I think I'm, I mentioned Jesus... Uh, just in order to say that um, well, it's this peculiar theory of mine that, that there are some people, what should we call them, people of destiny or something, who, whose lives are really, in a sense, taken out of their hands. They become what their followers decide they are to be, rather than us being able to know really who they were. So Jesus, for instance, it seems to me, has become what St. Paul wanted him to be. Socrates has become what Plato and Xenophon wanted him to be. Uh, But A, we don't absolutely know what he himself was, what Socrates, who Socrates was or who Jesus was. All we've got is, is reflections. What lessons does the story of Socrates, Alcibiades, Critias, and more, what does this story continue to teach you in your life as a European person in 2018? I find that kind of question almost impossible to answer. <laughs> Sorry. I write, I write history books just to explore and try to understand and try to communicate a particular period of history. I'm, I'm never in the first instance, or even the second and third instances, looking for resonances with uh, contemporary life. Um, so I'm not sure I can answer that. That's totally fine. So, Robin Waterfield, where can people find more of your work if they want to uh, get in touch or find what you've done? Well, I have a website, robinwaterfield.com. And other than that, of course, the answer is my work is available at all good bookshops. Absolutely. Robin Waterfield, thank you so much for taking this time today to discuss the life of Socrates and ancient Greece. You are very appreciated here on the show, sir. Well, Greg, thank you so much for setting it up. That's super. Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is performed and composed by Derek Strybig. You can find his music at www.wearewarmmusic.com. If you would like to support this show, please subscribe or leaving a rating in iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. <laughs>